Okay, good morning, uh, Professor Naki and also Professor Cho and also Jerry, uh, Jessica Cho. It's my honor to be here today to share with you the scientific aspect of the climate change and its implication to sustainable development. And I will probably shift the gear to talk more about the, the issues we are facing about the potential risk from the natural disasters due to the anthropogenic climate change. Well, we just got a very, very wonderful, inspiring talk from Professor Naki uh, about how to the transformations to uh, reach the 17 uh, sustainable goals. And these are really big pictures we, and also big challenges we are facing in this so-called Anthropocene. And while I was serving as the Director General in the Department of Natural Science and Sustainable Development for the Ministry of Science and Technology over the last few years, we had the opportunity to really scan and to look at what are the essential new technology or critical technologies and science needed to advance the new lives of Anthropocene. And these are some of the issues we came up with. And as you may see right here, well, these are all very important issues, such as the big data, the deep learning, the green technology, and nanotechnology, quantum uh, computer technologies, and also something about the new materials that can really improve our next generation or technologies. However, there's one very important part, as I highlight here, they all have to comply with the so-called 17 uh, sustainable goals, uh, well, well designed under the uh, so-called United Nations about a better future Earth. And, but I would like to give you some example about the lessons we learned in the past. Well, as we can tell, there is always unbalance or imbalance between the technology advance and the sustainable development. And this is one very basic example. In the 1950s, the engineers, they are very smart. They put the lead into the gas and they found that it increased the efficiency and stability of the combustion process in the engine of the car. It's good. It saves the energy. However, when later on in the 70s, people found out that the lead would come out and eventually affect our health, especially for the brain and the neural system development for the young kids and babies. No good. But that was solved completely because we changed the gas into the unneeded gas in the 70s. And in Taiwan, this was actually not done until the early 90s, only 30 years ago. So all of the, our participants here today, above the age of 30, might still be affected. You could be smarter than you are today if that has been solved earlier. But that was a joke anyway. But during the 1970s, there's another very important scientific product and actually, the so-called chlorofluorocarbons, carbons, the CFC is also, we call Freon-11 or Freon-12. They were not natural gas. They were the products from, by the chemical engineers. But they create this very important products because they are very effective so-called refrigerants for, to cool down our refrigerators. Nevertheless, during the 1980s, the scientists found out about the issue of the so-called ozone hole. And a big reason is that these release CFCs in, from the refrigerants, they will become uh, the key catalyst that create that cycle of, of ozone depletion during the springtime when the, the sun came out to hit the South Pole. So again, this problem is solved. It's relatively 
not too complicated, but it still takes an international protocol in Montreal in 86 to fix the issue. And they replace all these compounds of the so-called Freon 11 or 12 by other products. And now this issue is nearly all solved 30 years later. And indeed, in 1995, they received the so-called Nobel Prize in chemistry. So this is great discovery that the scientific advance eventually helped the progress of the, our mankind. Well, but the third issue I was also mentioned by Professor Naki earlier is even more complicated and more profound. It's about the industrial revolution. And that is the time we went to the new era about Anthropocene with so much new greenhouse gas released in the atmosphere and leading to the climate change and global warming. And there are substantial scientific evidence to indicate that this is, the re this is anthropogenic. They didn't come out in nature itself. It's because of the revolution of the use of so many uh, petroleum and also all these products. And in 97, we have this Kyoto Protocol. But a few years ago, we have this another meeting in Paris. And it's COP21. And right now, at this point, they are about to have the COP25 in Chile in next week. But this issue hasn't been solved. It's so complicated. And so, and these are the very important issues that would affect the so-called SDG. So let me further to talk about climate change. Well, there are different components, all very important. Well, we have to make all the strategies and decisions based on our scientific understanding. Although these understanding at this point, there are still some uncertainty. But we need to do this step by step to do better science with better understanding. Then we would know better how to do solve the impact and adaptation issue. And eventually we can reduce the impact. Well, the mitigation is reduced of the gas emissions. And this is a cycle, very important. So many, many different scientists and government agencies, or even the private sectors, are all working hard on this problem. Even though there are still a lot of challenges, including the disagreement among different groups of scientists or the uh, policy makers. Well, let me now get back to the local issues. Well, in Taiwan, we are vulnerable to heavy rainfall, the extreme flood event that really kills a lot of people. In this particular case, Morak, 10 years ago, well, with so much record-breaking rainfall of 3,000 millimeters over southern Taiwan, about more than 500 villagers in one village got buried. Very unfortunate. This is, but if you look at one year ahead of time or one year later, actually in southern Taiwan, there is a very serious drought issue. So as you can tell from the water amount from two big reservoirs, water reservoirs, one Usanto, the other is called Zengwen. So the water amount get into the very low part, which means we are having drought at that time. Then suddenly the storm comes, Morak, but flooding seriously. And then a few months later, another drought again. So. This is, these are the nature, nature disasters we have to face. So we have to deal with the, with the scientific, better science. These are other pictures taken just last year. This is in western part of Taiwan and western part of Japan. And this is Hong Kong. And this is, you know where, right? It's the Osaka airport, KIX. Well, and last year, we see so many storms from the satellite in, in the same time. So this is very serious. So we have nine storms 
occurring over the Western Pacific and Eastern to Western Pacific in the same time, in the same month. And this, this is another picture taken a long time ago. You might want to take a guess. This is over New York City, associated with uh, something you remember, Hurricane Sandy, almost seven years ago. And this is another picture of a southern you know, part of the United States, Texas, Houston, and it's associated with Hurricane Harvey. And this most recent one, east of the United States, is Typhoon and all we call Hurricane Florian hitting Bahama. It's pretty much leaving big, big, big damage to the place. And the most recent one in Taiwan, associated with Typhoon Mita, as it came over, we have a lot of problems. And the most updated example here is this photo taken in uh, Japan, especially the Tohoku area. And they never had this type of flood in the past, but it occurred just a week ago. Unfortunately, and actually Professor Naki was almost affected. He got out of Tokyo airport by the last flight. So congratulations, but I'm so sorry for the people who got affected later on. Well, so well, so there are scientific research is my expertise to try to understand are all these extreme weather events resulted from the anthropogenic climate change and global warming? It's a very tough scientific question, and we are still working on that. The answer is yes and or no. It depends on how you study these cases. So a systematic study are needed, and it has been ongoing for the last 30 or 40 years to try to answer these problem questions. So about the impact of the global warming, it's not only affecting the rainfall, the flood, it's also affecting our ecology and the disease health issue and food and energy and land use and also drought. So these are all related to the F-17 SDG goals. So we have to face this issue. And so a lot of research are ongoing, which I don't have time to talk about in detail, but I could in extra, well, circumstances, extra opportunities. Are these storms getting more active and will be more active in the future? Are they also getting more stronger and more destructive with more rainfall? And what about this overall impact of the anthropogenic forcing climate change? to the activities of this severe weather or climate. <laughs> and there are some answers, brief answers, what I, we know so far, which we can answer, although I didn't show you all scientific details. But we are more confident about some of the results here and less confident about the results here. Well, basically, potentially more coastal flooding is coming with more rainfall likely to increase and intensity stronger, more destructive and perhaps, we don't know this yet, but the number and you know, frequency of storms may actually decrease. But these are all very important scientific, scientific questions they are undergoing a lot of studies. So finally, let me talk about in Taiwan locally and we are facing a lot of problems associated with our environment, nature environment itself. And so we have to deal with this with a smarter disaster management strategy. And these are very important to improve the quality of people's life here in Taiwan, as well as for other countries with the same risk. And especially the risk, as we can tell, might be higher and higher in the future because of the climate change. So we have to be smart about building a better cycle for the risk management. And so that we can hire and better resilience to any impact 
and this will not come out directly. We, we need a very good system to improve and build up our resilience. But I can be very proud to tell you that in Taiwan, we are doing, we are in a very good position in terms of the execution of the policy and the research to improve our resilience to the natural disasters. And so let's get back again about all these, there are so many issues to be solved. And well, and Professor Nanti just made out some very, very important ideas about which way we can go for the transformations. And in terms of scientific research, there are quite a number of programs in the scientific or technology components. For example, Future Earth and the Belmont Forum, actually it, it is having its annual plenary in Taiwan right now, on the, on the other part of the NTU campus right now. And I was one of the steering committee member of this international organization. And there are so quite a number of the integrated research programs and agencies, multinational, and all, maybe some, are supported by the uh, so-called non-government organizations. And with all these efforts, we think that uh, we are doing better and better to with this, all the so-called science and technology alliances, we can do better to support the research and activities to help the global uh, sustainability. So I will stop here and taking the quote from Gothel. Well, I just give you some ideas about the scientific research. But knowing it's not enough, we have to apply the ideas we learn from science. And then, willing is not enough, we have to do it. And we have to take action and follow the very nice roadmap Professor Naki just made up. Thank you very much.